to know, to love, and to serve with Bishop Alfred Hughes, a series that listens to the message of Jesus, responds in love, and passes it on into the new millennium. Greetings in the Lord. We are continuing our series on sacred scripture. The term testament that we use, Old Testament, New Testament, is actually another word for covenant. Christians recognize that God entered into a covenant with Noah and then with Abraham, made more specific with Moses and with David. But the Christians also were very mindful of the prophecy of Jeremiah. The days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with the ancestors the day I took them by the hand to lead them forth from the land of Egypt. I will place the law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. This prediction of a new covenant was generally understood to mean a renewal, a deepening of the previous one. There was to be a continuity. It was in the second century that the collection of Christian writings recognized as inspired began to be referred to as the New Testament. In contrast, Christians then referred to the scriptures that came from Israel as the Old Testament. The writings that came to constitute the New Testament were written in stages. For almost a generation, the gospel and its application to life was done exclusively orally, word of mouth. Then some of the letters were written to follow up on evangelization of local communities and to address issues that were the causes of misunderstanding or even conflict in these communities. Then toward the end of the lives of the original apostles, the gospel accounts were written in order to ensure a reliable record of the basic events and message for future generations. The Acts of the Apostles actually then became part two of part one, St. Luke's Gospel, and recorded the growth of the early church, for both were written by Luke. Can we focus first on the Gospel according to Mark? It is probably the oldest Gospel account. It's the shortest the least developed in detail. It is generally attributed to Mark, the follower and interpreter of St. Peter, usually identified as John Mark in the Acts of the Apostles. He had accompanied Barnabas and Paul on the first missionary journey. He probably also helped Peter and Paul in Rome in the 60s. It was probably between 60 and 75 A.D., most likely between 68 and 73, that he wrote. The author was obviously a Greek speaker, who, although not an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry, drew richly on the second-hand account of those with whom he was associated. If we were to look at the Gospel account by Mark, we would recognize two principal divisions in the Gospel. The first runs from chapter 1 to almost all of chapter 8, and it focuses on the ministry of healing and preaching in Galilee. Part 2 focuses on the prediction of his suffering, then the account of his arrest, passion, death, and resurrection. If we were to look at the content of that gospel, we would see how Isaiah's prophecies were quoted by John the Baptist as he introduces Jesus to his followers. A heavenly voice echoing Psalm 2 tells the readers from the beginning, 
that Jesus is God's unique Son. In order to bring God's kingdom or rule to this world, he has the power to teach and to act that goes beyond all anticipation. Yet he is tested and opposed by Satan and the demons who already have control of foreshadowing of the dramatic confrontation with Satan that is to take place in the Passion. Jesus' healings, calming the storm, feeding the hungry, forgiving sin, all are manifestations that evil is being overcome. Yet the demons resist this invasion of their territory. Other opposition is exhibited by those who reject Jesus' teaching and challenge his power. A rejection vocalized particularly by the Pharisees and the scribes. Finally, opposition is reflected in the fact that those who come to accept and follow Jesus do not understand the message either. They have their own views about the kingship. It should be marked by immediate triumphal success and lordship over others in the manner of the kings of this world. And Jesus tries patiently, perseveringly, to move them beyond those limited understandings. Those who have no power are more open to the rule of God than those who are powerful. And there is nothing more effective than suffering to make one recognize a need for God. And so, by the middle of the gospel, it is clear that Jesus is going to have to suffer and die. Even though he predicts his resurrection, his words in Mark 13 show that the end will not come immediately and that his disciples will not be spared persecution and failure. His disciples still do not understand. And they all fail when he is arrested. He is abandoned in his passion, condemned unjustly by the chief priests of the people and the Roman government, mocked by all. Even God, the Father, seems not to hear him. Yet at that very moment, when he's plunged into the depths of suffering and death, God vindicates him by showing who and what Jesus really is. He is raised from the dead with the indication that his disciples will meet him in Galilee in the place where they first came to follow him. They then follow him anew, having learned to painful experience that resurrection comes only from passion and death. That's Mark's gospel. Now Matthew and Luke will basically record the very same event, but there are some differences. Matthew probably wrote his entire gospel in Aramaic. He apparently knew both Greek and Aramaic or Hebrew. He probably wrote between the years 80 and 90 AD. The location might have been Antioch. Mark's location, probably Rome. But Matthew is writing to the Jewish people. And it's fascinating what he does. First of all, he introduces what is called an infancy narrative in the first two chapters. And he traces Jesus' origin to Joseph, to David, to fulfill the prophecies of old. And then he goes on in the subsequent chapters to unpack in five different discourses and events connected with them what is basically the message of Jesus Christ. It is almost as if he's imitating the five books of the old uh, of the Pentateuch in the Old Testament. He's interested in presenting the new law as revealed by Jesus. And in each one of those discourses, followed by a series of events that Jesus enters into, the word and deed are united. If we look at Luke, we will find a different motif followed. Luke was probably a physician, a fellow worker and companion of St. Paul. It is presumed that his gospel was written about 85 A.D. 
Luke was probably an educated Greek speaker, skilled writer, who knew the Jewish scriptures in Greek and who reported on Jesus' ministry through the eyes of Paul. This was probably written to the churches affected directly or indirectly by Paul's mission. Now, St. Luke also has a particular focus because he's writing to Gentile Christians. He does not do what Matthew does and focus on all the different ways in which Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. Rather, in two books, the Gospel and the Acts of the Apostles, he details the journey of Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem, where he suffers, dies, and rises. And then, from Jerusalem, the church moves on to Rome in the Acts of the Apostles. Those are the two books of Luke. Now, if we are first to look at the Gospel account, we recognize that just as Matthew, Luke also introduces a two-chapter infancy narrative. And in that narrative, he focuses not on Joseph, but on Mary, and views the, the, the way in which Jesus was born, conceived, born, predicted, his early life, to the eyes of Mary. And in then the course of the development that Luke provides, he details a way in which uh, so many events in the life of Jesus uh, centered around meals with his disciples, his future apostles, and the extraordinarily deep teaching almost inevitably takes place at a meal. And that is why it is so significant to note at the end of Luke's Gospel, two disciples from going on to Emma, the day that Jesus rises from the dead, have not been able to believe that he's risen, not understood what he had said and did. It is at a meal that an Emma that is revealed to him or revealed to them what everything is all about, and they make their way back to Jerusalem where they're supposed to be in order to know the fulfillment of the prophecy. Then, of course, Luke unpacks that journey to Rome, following the mission of the church, beginning in Jerusalem, going again to Galilee, going to Samaria and to Judea, Barnabas and Saul going, uh, uh, converting the Gentiles, coming back to Jerusalem to have their mission and understanding of their ministry approved. Paul then moving to the ends of the earth, his arrest back in Jerusalem, his being sent as a prisoner to Rome, and his journey, his sojourn in Rome. In all of this, I would like to mention what is most important, not the details, however important history is, but it is our receiving that saving history and recognizing Jesus revealing himself to us through those sacred words and inviting us to respond to him with faith. We'll be back to talk with Bishop Hughes and look at how we can respond to this message of Jesus. It's like coming home again. I like the feeling. Maybe it's time you took a fresh look at what's missing in your life. God knows I failed, but God's never failed me. Maybe it's time you took another look. When I went through that difficult time, I left the church, but the church never left me. I'm glad I'm back. There's a warm welcome waiting. Maybe it's time you took another look. Come home. A message of hope with love from the Catholic Diocese of Baton Rouge.
I'm Deacon Bob Perlow, and we're back again with Bishop Alfred Hughes. Now we're talking about the New Testament, and we're talking about the Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles. And Bishop, I love the way you compared the Old Covenant with the New Covenant and how we bring these two, two testaments or these two covenants together. It's incredibly important that the unity between them be preserved. Uh, Some of the anti-Semitism that has crept into the history of the world and Christianity has unfortunately prompted us to to oppose them one to the other. But the early Christian, Christ himself, saw himself as profoundly Jewish and fulfilling all that God had already revealed, the Father had already revealed before he came into this world. From the Gospels, you see that Jesus had a wonderful knowledge of, of the, the, the prophecies and the prophecies. And, and, the times and uh-huh. You talked about the, the different audiences or the different uh, people that uh, the authors of the, the Testaments in the, uh, in the Gospels were talking to. You talked about Mark, and you talked about how Mark used this uh, to more or less bridge this gap between the old and, and new. Do you think they had this in mind when, when they wrote this? Oh, I, I uh, you know, each one had a perspective um, that was rooted more in the pastoral reality he was attempting to address. So in that sense, he was conscious of the perspective he was bringing. Uh, but uh, it, it was Matthew who particularly um, wanted to, to reveal to his Jewish audience all of the different ways in which the prophecies of old were fulfilled in Christ. And so you find a refrain, a refrain in Matthew, this happened so that the scriptures might be fulfilled, dot, 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 whatever it was. And, and that is a refrain in Matthew's gospel more so than either Mark or Luke. And the Beatitudes, does that uh, perfect the, the, the Jewish law and the, the commandments? Exactly. It, it, it's a reflection <clears throat> on, on the commandments and pointing to the fact that the Holy Spirit is now touching the heart and inviting us not just to uh, avoid adultery, but lust. Not only to avoid killing, but harboring wrath. So, so it's bringing us to a new attitude, a, a different attitude. Right. And one of the things that you pointed out in, in that first gospel, Mark's gospel, was suffering. That he pointed to suffering and how Jesus revealed that it's through suffering and his passion that we would uh, receive this fulfillment of, of God's promise. Why is suffering so important, you think, in, in the gospel passage? And why was it important in Jesus' life? Well, uh, it's incredibly important for us to recognize that the only way in which sin is going to be reversed, the power of sin, is through suffering. Now, this is is very important, what you're saying here, because sometimes we don't hear this in religious presentations. It's incredibly important. And um, this is why Jesus, despite the fact Everyone around him wanted him to use his divine power to avoid suffering. Peter, the, the foremost among mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. and he insisted, no, you have to go through it. It's it, it suffering, suffering worn as a sacrificial offering in in an expiation for sin that is redemptive. And, and, uh, interesting how it it was Mark's gospel, of course, that particularly insists that this is going to have to mark the the life of a a genuine disciple of the Lord. And the gospel was written in Rome, where the persecution was Mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and so uh, Mark was reminding the, the people to whom he was writing that they were expect, they should expect to go through in some analogous way with Jesus. Wow. So it's it's a connection and a relationship with the 
the mission, that we take up the mission of Jesus. Now, this is diametrically opposed to the message in the world that we should avoid suffering at all costs mm-hmm. and perceive pleasure as an end in itself. Yeah, we see that more and more in today's society and in the media. Now, help us a little more with it, with Matthew. Now, you talked about the fact that Matthew was written for the instruction to the Jews or basically to to bring the Jewish and this new message of Jesus together, the traditions together. Um, and you talked about him speaking of the genealogy. So that does bring that, uh, I suppose, from uh, when we say so-and-so begot, begot, begot. And when you look in sacred scripture, you wonder, why do all? Why do we have to go through all these generations? But that, that was incredibly important to uh, establish the fact that, that Jesus was a descendant of David. Now remember, even though Joseph was not his real father, it was the husband of the family that gave the name mm-hmm. and the lineage to these children. And, and so the Jews would understand this in that way. Also, can I, can I uh, re-mention this? Uh, I mentioned it in the presentation earlier on. Fascinating how Matthew takes a whole uh, series of teachings on a given area, brings them together into five extended discourses in his gospel. Uh, for, the fir- for instance, the first one is found in verses 5 to 7. <clears throat> and, and what we have focused on there begins with the Beatitudes, and it, and it goes through his taking all of the teaching of Moses with regard to the law and breaking open the deeper content of that teaching uh, as Jesus expounded it. And then it, it, it goes on as a, another set uh, of, of parables with regard to the kingdom and understanding of the church that he was going to establish. And that there's five different gatherings of faith. Um, and then, as if to confirm the authenticity of that teaching, Jesus performs a miracle hmm. following each of those uh, discourses. And as we move into Luke, we see that Matthew was written uh, with the genealogy and Joseph, and, you know, the, with the angel revealed to Joseph. But as we get into Luke now, written for the Gentiles, it's more from a perspective of Mary. And we, we have the beautiful mm. Magnificat, which is a continuation from the Old Testament, almost mentioned in, in Samuel. Uh, I heard someone say once that perhaps Luke interviewed Mary and discussed. That's, you know, we, how, how are we ever going to know? Yeah. But, uh, but, but things like... Uh, she pondered these things in her heart. Yeah. You know, just that, that only Mary could tell somebody what her innermost thoughts were. It, it, it suggests that, but we, we really have no way of knowing for sure. And, and you talked about the relationship with uh, Luke and Paul. Um, Luke was a disciple and a companion. So, so this would bring the, the message to the Gentiles mm-hmm. even more, since Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, can I, can I go back sure. a moment? You, you mentioned Mary's hunger of the world. Uh, I'd like in a very special way, uh, now given the, uh, the panoramic background we've been talking about and the basic uh, understanding of the content of the Gospels and then the actual apostles, the most important thing that we really want to keep in mind is how we receive this and and then incorporate it into our lives and respond. Now, if we remember, these were written, in a sense, in three states. First, the events and the teaching happened. Secondly, after Jesus ascended into heaven, the early apostles, the first apostles, had to wrestle with the meaning of all of this and, 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 and how to teach it and how to apply it and so forth. And all of this was done orally, verbally. Then the third stage was towards the end of their lives. Um, they recognized under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit it's going to be important to have some a normative uh, account to pass on uh, when the eyewitnesses had all died. Mm-hmm. All right, so the third stage of 
Christian revelation led to the formation of the gospel. When we pray over the gospel, we need to do the reverse. We begin with the text. Then we need to have some understanding of where the text comes from, the, uh, the background for it, so that we're not interpreting it in, in an irresponsible way. But most importantly, we want them to meet Christ in prayer. And we, we miss the point if we spend all the time just looking at the, the physical text or just looking at the background. We, we want to meet Christ and to let His Word enter our minds and our hearts and move toward a desire to change our lives, to live our lives in accordance with that Word. And that's the most important way in which you and I want to receive and respond to God's inspired Word in God. So we bring Christ into our own daily lives. And, and open our hearts to him. Bishop, uh, as we move into a new millennium, which signifies the birth and the coming of Christ into the world, how do we apply these in our own lives? You talk to us about praying through the scriptures. How do we apply these stories and this great covenant in our own lives? Well, you know, what, what we actually celebrate is... Um, that pivotal point between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's not a uh, a, a secular milestone. We're commemorating the the 2000th anniversary of the birth of the Lord and the beginning of the Christian era. Sometimes we see people who are promoting a secularist approach wanting to speak of the common era. But it's the Christian era. Anno Domini, that's A.D., in the year of the Lord, and B.C., before Christ. That, that's the uh, understanding that, 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 that we bring. Now, it's interesting that in the Catholic Church, we're going to celebrate the millennium, not at midnight, January 1, but December 25, mm-hmm. because it's the Incarnation that we are celebrating, and hopefully by doing that, presenting to the whole world uh, a a reminder of what it is we're marking at this point. And the most important way in which we can celebrate the Lord's birth is to be a good disciple, to take his word, to, to let it form and elicit from us uh, a response in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Bishop. And thank you for being with us, uh, and thanks again to the Bishop for what has been a beautiful presentation on Sacred Scripture. We'll see you next time.